Your instructor is Melinda Myers. Ms. Myers is a gardening expert, television radio host, author, columnist, and educator with more than 30 years of experience and a master's degree in horticulture. She has authored or co-authored more than 20 gardening books and has written articles for such magazines as Better Homes and Gardens and Fine Gardening. Ms. Myers hosts the nationally syndicated Melinda's Garden Moment segments and appears regularly as a guest expert on various national and local television and radio shows. In 2013, she received the American Horticulture Society's B.Y. Morrison Communication Award for effective and inspirational communication. Hi, isn't this beautiful? We're here at Meadow Lark Botanical Gardens. It's a great space for inspiration and ideas for your own backyard. Now it's taken them a few years and a staff of professionals and volunteers to create this garden. But you can do it in one year, believe it or not. It's all about understanding the science behind growing plants and landscape designs to create a successful and beautiful garden over the long term. Let me show you what I mean. We're gonna take a look at the test gardens that we planted specifically for this series for one full growing season, spring through fall. Let's take a look at what we've done. We started with empty areas and overgrown areas. We had weedy gardens and we put in new gardens. We improved the soil and renewed old beds. We added new plantings and new spaces for the homeowners to enjoy. We mixed in a few containers to add variety and texture. We looked at eyesores and we addressed and resolved many gardening challenges you may have. We started just like you with common problems faced by many gardeners. We want to design a garden that works for you and your dream for something better. How did we get here? By following what I call the four R's, the right plant for the right purpose in the right place with just the right look. What I mean by right purpose is matching the right plant to the growing conditions and use or purpose in the landscape. Whether it's screening a bad view, creating year-round interests, plantings to attract birds and butterflies, creating a cutting garden of flowers, or growing food for yourself to enjoy, and much, much more. So how do we figure this all out? Well, gardens go through a series of changes. It's an ongoing process that we'll follow with our test gardens. We'll show you methods and strategies for updating, maintaining, and managing your garden throughout the seasons and have fun along the way. We all start with a mess and a great idea, but before you go shopping for plants, evaluate your situation. You'll wanna gather ideas from beautiful botanical gardens like this or on garden tours. So the first stage is to evaluate your growing conditions and your space. The next step is planning and design. Then we'll prepare the site and plant. We'll keep things going, but continually make adjustments and improvements as needed. Because one thing you're gonna learn is gardening is dynamic. It's never really finished. And a great tool to help you with this is a journal. It's a good place to track ongoing and seasonal changes. It's much easier than you think. So let's get started. Come with me as we visit our first test garden. We're here on this beautiful large lot. It could be in the suburbs or it could be in the country. We've got a large expanse of grass, some beautiful trees and shrubs, and lots of potential. But the first thing we need to do is assess what we want to keep. And then, what do we want to add? And make sure we have plenty of time to not only plant, but maintain it. So let's get started looking at the potential for creating a beautiful landscape here on this large lot. As you can see, I spent some time walking and talking with the homeowners about their poolside area. We saw plants they wanted to keep, plants in bad shape, and lots and lots of weeds. These homeowners can't do everything at once, so we're starting with what they can save, what absolutely has to go, and what can be moved elsewhere. We've got some plants at our urban garden that don't work there, but might work here, and that's a way to save money when you're working on your own garden. 
they've got some nice statuary, a sundial, and also a statue that they can think about using as focal points in the garden. You might think about that too as you assess your own space. But let's bring this back to your garden. What do you need to do to get started with an old flower bed? One of the most common questions I get about perennial gardens is what to do when they're overrun with weeds or that aggressive perennial that just took over. Well, the first step is to identify those plants you want to keep and set them aside. Just like this peony. Here we're going to make sure that we take all of the weeds out of the rhizome of the peony because the worst thing we want to do is replant them back in with the plants. We're going to set our plants aside, cover those roots up so they don't dry out, and save them for replanting once the beds and the weed are under control. Now we've got to deal with all these weeds. One of the problems are not only the roots, as you can see here, which are prolific, but also the seeds that proliferate. So we can dig these up, but as you can guess, this would take a lot of work. Cultivating propagates more plants, so you'd need to do it for two seasons and monthly. That's two gardening seasons you miss. We can also use Roundup, kill off the weeds once the good plants are gone, wait a couple weeks, take care of any other weeds that sprout, and then work in and amend our soil. We've decided to go with the Roundup. So once we've got the weeds under control, we're gonna get in and work the soil before we put our new plants in this bed. Wow, what a difference. We got the weeds out, we preserved the perennials we wanna keep, but we're not quite ready to get started planting. So a couple weeks ago, I took a soil test. Basically, I took soil about four to six inches deep from several places around the garden, mixed it together so I'd have a good representative sample. And two weeks later, I got the results back from a state certified lab. You may wanna call your extension service to find the nearby service for you. What I found from the soil test is my pH is neutral no need to lime. I also found I needed some nitrogen, good for growing leaves and stems of plants, but I'm high to excessive in phosphorus, good for flowering, fruiting, and roots, and potassium, good for disease resistance and hardiness, so I don't need to add more of those nutrients. Because of my soil test results, I decided to use an organic nitrogen fertilizer. By using this, I'm providing low level of nitrogen slowly over a long period of time, so I won't burn my plants, even if it gets hot and dry. I also know that I have a non-leaching source of phosphorus. But the cool thing about this product is that when the plants, the microorganisms, work on the fertilizer, they release the phosphorus and potassium that's tied up in your soil. So many of us have high to excessive levels of phosphorus and potassium, and that comes from years of doing 10-10-10, 12-12-12, or other complete fertilizers in our gardens and landscapes. So when the microorganisms work on this, fertilizer, it releases some of that phosphorus, good for root development, flowering and fruiting, and some of that potassium as well. So we get a double benefit. We are going to use this fertilizer in a hand spreader to distribute it evenly over our soil so that we can mix it into the soil. In this case, we just put it on the surface and when we plant, we're fine. Now, we've got the soil ready, but we're not quite done. We need to do a little bit of evaluation and assessing of our growing conditions. Now, one of the plants I'm considering using is this catmint. And one of the reasons is this area is hot, dry, and full sun. Plus, our homeowners really don't have a lot of time to tend their garden, and we're nearby a pool where they plan to entertain. So we want something that's going to look good all season, will tolerate the heat and drought of the summer conditions here and the cold of this climate. You always want to pick perennials that will tolerate the average minimum winter temperature, so you know that after you put them in the ground one year, they should come back the next, the next, and for many more to come. So we want heat tolerant for this case, cold tolerant for winter temperatures, hardy to our zone, that's what hardiness zone is all about, and suited to the growing conditions. Plus, an added benefit, this plant not only blooms all season with low maintenance, but it brings in beneficial insects and butterflies, so a little added beauty. Well, now that we've evaluated and assessed our landscape, just like you're gonna do, then we can go and get started planning. Part of our planning is taking good measurements so we can figure out how many plants we really need. It's important to measure even those odd angles you find in lots of gardens. I'll get back to this later when we go into the design studio. Right now, let's take another look at the open area of the yard.
We decided to add a vegetable garden to our landscape. We picked this spot because it's got full sun and great for growing vegetables. We also decided to start small because we have limited time to plant and tend the vegetables. But our problem is we've got this grass to get rid of to create a garden. There are a couple things we can do. One is kill the grass with a total vegetation killer and then add amendments and improve the soil. Or we can use a sod cutter, rent something from a tool loan center, or use a flat shovel to literally dig that sod up, use it to repair bare spots in your lawn, or turn it upside down and throw it in the compost pile to decompose to eventually end up in a future garden. Or you could do what we did, and that's creating a raised bed. We took cardboard, put it over to suffocate the existing lawn, added 12 inches of topsoil to create our raised beds. But your job isn't over because you want to pick a good quality topsoil just like any gardening adventure you have. So let's talk about that. Let's start with what topsoil actually is. It's the soil on the surface that's often scraped away when a farmer sells his land or a new subdivision is built. They take off the top couple inches of soil and sell it to be used in new garden plantings. But where do you get this? Well, you can check the internet or the yellow pages, but I recommend you talk to family and friends. Find out where they bought good quality topsoil from a reliable source in your area. And then when you do buy it, look for a blended mix, one suited for flower and vegetable gardens, and check the quality. Here we've got a decent pot of topsoil, but we've got a lot of stones and it contains a lot of sand. So we're gonna do a little additional amending. We've purchased some good quality compost. You can also make your own. We're gonna add two inches, mix it into the top 12 inches of our topsoil to create a good consistent planting media for our plants to grow. But I've gotten a bit ahead of myself because before we plant, we need to do a little planning. So join me in my garden studio and I'll help you with that planning process so that we can be sure to have a good healthy garden and landscape for years to come. Welcome to my garden studio. You don't need a fancy place to make your plans. Most people I know don't have a drafting table, let alone a potting bench inside their house. But you can sketch your plans at your kitchen table, coffee table, or even spread out on the floor, whatever works for you. Okay, so what do I mean when I say start with a plan? Well, I'll take you through the process we used when designing changes for our large test garden. To make sketching easier, you may want to gather a few of these. A tape measure. We're going to be measuring out our garden space and developing a plan, so you're going to want to use a long tape measure. 50 feet, 100 is even better if you have that available. A straight edge. It makes it easier. I have one that's a scale to help in terms of translating measurements into my plan and keeping it on scale, but you can just use a regular ruler. A template of circles. I thought this one was kind of fun because not only did it have the circles to represent the plants, but it also had some of the plant shapes and sizes. Makes it a little more attractive and I think a lot more fun. Graph paper, available at most office supply centers. It's a great way to draw to scale using the little squares for measurement. And tracing paper because we're gonna develop a base map, a plan that will always stay consistent, showing what we have, and we'll use tracing paper to do all our trial design ideas. That way, if we drop a plan we don't like, we throw out that piece and use another piece of tracing paper. It saves a lot of work down the road, so we're not redoing our base map every time. Now let's talk about plat surveys. Now you may be lucky enough to have a copy of your own plat survey, or maybe you're able to access one from your local municipality, and in some communities, they're even available online. And we were able to find a plat survey of our large space garden. But even though it was out of date, it did tell us some important things. So when you take a look at this, you can see the location. We're located on a busy road. It gives us the overall dimensions of our landscape and where the house fits on that. So that made measuring a little bit easier. It also told us where the septic tank and the septic field were located. And that's important because we don't want to drive heavy equipment over our septic field and we need to be careful about our plantings. And it also gave us kind of an area where the pool was located located in the fence as well. Now we updated it by drawing in the more recent changes. And to do this, we needed to do some measuring. Now here are some pointers on measuring. When you're looking at 
measuring your landscape, pick one place that's always going to be your starting point. Maybe it's the back corner of your house. You'll measure from there out to one boundary, there to another boundary, there to the third boundary, and to the back. That way it's all consistent. You'll make sure you place all your hardscapes properly on your location and then you can draw out from there. That will help ensure that your house is properly sited on your plan and all the other features. If you measure from separate spots, who knows what you'll end up with. Now, let's look at the design of our large test site. I want you to see the drawings at the various stages. After taking some measurements, we updated our plat survey and developed a base map. As you can see, we kept some of the important details and added some updates. The neighbors and the homeowners created the shared driveway, a new addition. The homeowners also created a turnaround drive, so we wanted to make sure to capture that as well. The other thing we have are some of the existing plantings, the large trees on the property that tell us about the sun and shade patterns. And we've got the exact measurements for the fence, the propane fill tank, and where the pool actually ended up. We added the deck and the air conditioner, and those are our permanent features. This is going to be our base map that we'll keep referring back to. We'll use our tracing paper overlays to add new additional information and to try out our changes as we do our planning. Now the first overlay we typically do is related to weather conditions and views as well. So as you take a look at this, we've got a very busy road and that means noise and it means salt spray from the cars passing by. So we wanna capture that. They have a bit of a windbreak in there right now and a noise barrier, but we might wanna beef it up a bit. The winter winds typically come through between that barrier and a few other plantings and reach the house. We're going to mon monitor those and see if we need some additional plantings that will help reduce those wind problems. Now the house is built on a, a hill so the ground slopes away. That means no drainage problems for us, but it's good to capture some of those slopes so we can keep that in mind as we develop our gardens. Summer breezes and at times gusty winds are coming from this direction and because of the neighbor's plantings often swirl around behind this garden fence and even within the pool area as well. So we're keeping that in mind. Now north is to the top of the diagram here. So the winter sun is coming from the south. That's important when we're growing broadleaf evergreens or other plants that really are sensitive to winter sun. This gives us an idea of the weather conditions and the climate and all of those growing conditions we need to consider. This is a huge property. And so what the homeowners decided is really to kind of space out their improvements and focus first on those areas that are most important to them. You may want to do the same thing. They entertain a lot and their pool is kind of the focal point. So we decided to reduce our plan initially and just look at that back area, their priority, and then we'll come revisit this base map as we expand in the future. Now let's take a closer look at that smaller diagram. We focused in on the area we want to set as a priority for our redesign. And in that, we're going to look at some of the important issues to consider. So once again, we're going to use our tracing paper to identify those, and that'll help narrow things down. So in this case, we've got an air conditioner that we really want to shade for two reasons. Mask the view so it looks okay, but then also if we shade our air conditioners, we can reduce the energy use significantly. So it's good for the environment and good for your budget. Also looking at where our best views are. The homeowner spends a lot of time entertaining, so the kitchen overlooks the pool area and the deck. So we really want to make sure we have a good view from inside the house looking out from the deck looking out, and so we create a nice inviting environment for the homeowners as well as their guests. Now when we look into this area, the pool is beautiful, but that back bed needs a little work. So we're gonna create a nice flower garden that's gonna look good through spring through fall where they really spend a lot of time outside. Because they like to entertain, more seating area is better. So we're gonna expand this area into a little bit of in the garden seating area so these people can look into the pool in the house. We also know that we have a gate here and a gate here, so access to the backyard is close to the house. The homeowners want some fresh from the garden vegetables, but they don't really want them cluttering up their entertainment area, but they want them convenient. 
since there are trees on this side of the house shading the property, we really need to get that vegetable garden in full sun for best productivity. So we're moving that to the back behind the fence. And I think we're gonna do maybe some raised beds. On this side of the house, we have a propane fill tank that's kind of obnoxious. It's easy to see from the road. The homeowners see it when they come home from work and really would like to improve that view. So now we kind of have an idea of how we're gonna get in and out to the backyard what the pri priorities are so we can start identifying uses for those property. Our next overlay will be kind of the garden beds and plantings or hardscapes. Now we're pretty well set in this case for hardscapes. We've got a nice deck, um, the drive's all been improved, so we really don't need to do anything hardscape wise here and the fence is in, but we do have some planting beds. As I mentioned, we're gonna put a perennial garden here and our sitting area. We decided to do raised beds, so we're gonna mark those in. Easy access to water, that's important. Full sun, and we're gonna have some built-in animal protection too because they'll be out away from the house a little bit and we don't wanna feed the animals as much as the family. We're gonna put a planting here. We're gonna cover these with shrubs to really block out that view and this fence is beautiful, but it's kind of big and overwhelming. And as the neighbors drive by, we want them to have a good view. And when our homeowners pull in at the end of a hard day of work, we want them to have a good view. So we're gonna look for a four season plant to really improve that. Now, this is still a pretty big design. And so what I did is I took a piece of graph paper and pulled that perennial bed right out. And you may wanna do this for your individual planting beds so that you have a little bit bigger scale. Same procedure goes. Start with a base map, outline the overall shape. Graph paper is great because it allows you to place the plants where they belong. Tracing paper allows you to try out your designs. And so now we have a planting plan that we can take to the garden center with us and look at plants and try to fit them into that design and have a good space. So we've sketched in some potential for planting beds, a few of our desirable plants, and we're gonna do some things that we know we'd like to do, but they may change as we move along. So throughout this process, we'll do a reality check as we visit the garden center, as we bring our plants home and throughout. So we wanna keep amending this plan. You probably will too, because this is just a draft. We'll both keep making changes as we go through the course. Remember, it's much easier to move plants, planting beds, walks, and patios on paper rather than once the holes are dug, the planting bed prepared, and the paver set. So starting with a plan will save you time and money, and it'll save you a lot of frustration replacing ill-suited or improperly placed plants and the money spent on too many plants, one of my problems, or those not appropriate for your design. It's kind of like going to the garden center with a grocery list. So if you're feeling, feeling a bit overwhelmed by all of this process, you may want to call in a professional. But doing a little homework ahead of time will ensure you get the best design and one that reflects your personality as well. Um, as you're doing this process. And the good news is some garden centers and nurseries even provide design services if you purchase the plants from them. As you develop your planting areas, consider the various types of plants you may want to include. Some plants will provide just a season of beauty, others a year, and still others multiple seasons and years. Annual plants complete their life cycle in just one year. They start as a seed, grow, flower, produce seeds, and die. Now that's botanically speaking, but there are also plants that we treat as annuals because the cold winters or hot summers stop their life and they complete that cycle in one year due to the weather. And if they were in a milder climate, they might last for two, three or more years. It may help you to think of planting it annually to keep annuals and perennials straight. An annual, botanically speaking, is a sunflower. But a climate annual, climatically speaking, an annual like wax begonia, for me in a cold climate, it completes its life cycle in one year. In milder climates, it can grow for several years. So it's really a perennial for some and an annual for others. Now we use annuals for color throughout the season. They're great in containers, in the garden, planted in mass, or mixed with perennials, trees, and shrubs. Now here are a few flowers commonly grown as annuals. And if you're in a warmer region of the world, you may be growing some of these as biennials or perennials. 
Sunflowers are a favorite for gardeners, and they're fun to grow with kids, and I love them too. Great from seed to flower, and you can enjoy eating the seeds and enjoying the beauty of the flower, but you may also enjoy the birds and the squirrels it attracts to the garden. And it's a fun, easy plant for kids, and great to measure the sunflower as it grows along with the young gardeners in your life. Ageratum or floss flower is a wonderful annual that comes in white, blues, and pinks often used as the blue in the annual garden. I like the taller Blue Horizon variety that gets about 18 to 20 inches tall. Excellent as a cut flower. I like to plant it with perennials because that taller variety looks as a little looser, a little more open, and looks perennial in nature. The shorter, more compact varieties are great around the garden edge. Lobelia, excellent in cooler temperatures, so great where your springs and falls are cool, or if you grow in an area with lots of sunlight, but cooler temperature. Beautiful blues, whites, and it makes a nice trailing or edging plant. Celosia or coxcomb, great for hot, dry areas, an excellent cutting flower, and it holds its color even when it dries. The crested variety kind of looks like colorful coral. The plume types are nice and airy, and the wheat forms have small flowers on short or tall plants. Gazania or treasure flower is great for hot, dry conditions. The flowers close up late in the day, so use them in containers or gardens where you can enjoy their beautiful flowers throughout the day. Petunia is a longtime favorite of gardeners, good and tough. I've used them in a lot of urban garden projects where they take a little bit of abuse and a little bit of benign neglect. So if you're a busy gardener, it's one to include. And if you like to tend your plants, there are many choices available. Verbena, there are annual and biennial forms of verbena, and it's a wonderful plant. Great for hummingbirds, great for butterflies. Um, the, creep, the creeping trailing types are good as an edge. The biennial verbena bonariensis, we'll talk about that. I grow as an annual in colder climates, is tall and great for attracting hummingbirds and butterflies to the garden. But it can be weedy in milder climates. Heliotrope, an annual for many of us, has fragrant flowers in white, light blue, or purple. Wonderful in containers. I use it by my front entrance so when people come to visit, they get a nice, fragrant welcome. Salvia, there are annual and perennial forms, but the annual forms are great for cutting, good for color all season. Hummingbirds love them, as well as the butterflies. In fact, we were doing some work out in a garden and the hummingbirds were nectaring on the salvia and all the big pots, and it was wonderful to be amongst the flowers and the hummingbirds. Nicotiana, fragrant at night. They vary in size from about eight inches to five feet tall. Fragrant flowers in the evening, white, pink, red, Lime green, yellow, lots of choices available. They will reseed as well. And fuchsia, a great shade plant. Needs moist soil, must have shade. Great in hanging baskets, great in the garden with the upright type, and excellent for bringing hummingbirds to your garden. Now biennials spend their first life just as leaves in the garden. In the second year, they produce leaves and flowers, seed, and then die. Foxglove is probably one you recognize. If you plant these two years in a row and allow them to reseed, it almost acts like a perennial in the garden. Now there are many biennials that are traditional favorites. I mentioned foxglove, so you may want to include some in honor of a family member, in honor of a memory, and also you can plant them from seed right in the garden, and that'll save you money and time as many of these are self-seeding. Foxgloves, I mentioned before, are great. Upright plants, good for shade. Their tubular flowers really add a lot of interest to the garden. Sweet William is a much smaller scale, a member of the carnation family, and just has sweet, as the name implies, small flowers, look like a bouquet above the leaves. Hollyhocks, nice bold flowers, great for full sun. Even though they may have some problems with insects and disease, you can mask that with nearby plantings. And some of you may have even made hollyhock, doll, hollyhock dolls from the flowers when you were young. And parsley, we usually grow that as an annual, but if it overwinters, it will come back and produce seeds and flowers, flowers first and then seeds. Not as tasty the second year, but kind of fun when it survives a tough winter for those of us in the north. Now, perennials spend their first year just as leaves. Their second year, they produce leaves and flowers, and they live indefinitely, hopefully for many years to come. And you may have heard the old saying, the first year they sleep, 
the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. So patience is needed to let them reach their full size. Coneflower is a good example of a perennial. Now over time, growing perennials can save you time planting and money spent buying annuals every year. You can divide and trade perennials with friends and relatives. It's a good way to save money and memories. It's a great heritage plant. Now you might have heard when you plant perennials, you're done. No additional work is needed. And as you've seen, perennials, like all plants, are living and require care, but much less than others. I always am asked by gardeners, you know, I'm looking for the perfect perennial, one that blooms all season, requires no maintenance, and is inexpensive or better yet, free. Well, my response is if a plant sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There are a few perennials that fit this description, but most of them create a weed problem in the garden or are invasive and have moved into and taken over some of our natural areas, so they should be avoided. Now you can extend the bloom time by using a mix of perennials. Don't be afraid to add a few annuals as well to provide season-long color and include a few bulbs to further extend the color and enjoyment in the garden. Here are a few plants that you might consider in your perennial garden. Asters for fall beauty, daylilies, the flowers are edible if you could beat the animals to them, and they're tough and hardy and there are new repeat bloomers out on the market. Yarrow, great for hot, dry conditions, nice fern-like foliage. Pick one that's not aggressive. Some can be reseeders that take over the garden. Others are a little better mannered. I mentioned salvia early. The perennial forms are great. Just make sure you select a variety that performs well in the garden. Veronica or Speedwell, similar to a salvia, but I find much easier to grow in whites, blue, and red. Coreopsis, a great yellow daisy-like flower, great for dry conditions once it is established. And an old-fashioned favorite, the peony. Gives you season-long foliage, nice red leaves when it emerges, good red fall color, and fragrant, sometimes fragrant blooms in the spring. So a nice one to consider. Well, I hope this has given you some good ideas about the types of plants and how to design with them. But we're not quite done. Come with me back outside. So now what do you do? Take some time to walk around and dream a bit and consider what's realistic for you to accomplish, especially in this first year. Look at your schedule, available time, budget, growing conditions, and of course your dream. Then write it down on paper for fine tuning and always design with plants in mind for your unique situation. In the next session, we'll apply these principles to a much smaller space with a different set of challenges. Then it's off to the garden center where we apply the four R's to plant shopping. We'll look for the right plant for the right purpose to put in the right place to give us the right look. And we'll help you apply the four R's to your design process. See you then.